This is a brand new 158 square meter home we built right here in Wallaceville Upper Hutt. Coming up, we'll show you the footage of the build from start to finish, I'll break down the design and discuss elements of the build in detail. Stick around to the end of the video to see this amazing finished home. Wallaceville Estate is a greenfield subdivision here in Upper Hutt. In general, the sites were flat. This one here, we needed to do a little bit of work to build it up with base course, but nothing too drastic for our team. When I'm starting a project like this, one of the first things I'll do is meet with the client, we'll go over the design, make sure that what they're hoping to build aligns with their budget and their expectations, make sure we're all on the same page. This is a 400 square metre section and including the little roof entrance area, there's 160 square metres of site coverage. That's 40% site coverage. The next thing you have to think about is all your areas with concrete and you want to make sure that you're still leaving permeable surfaces for rain to drain in. All the jobs in this area need a soak pit. They're designed by an engineer. We put a chamber in, we fill the rest of it with river rock and geo cloth and then we cover it all in. On these site plans we'll also mark things like the patio, the path and the driveway. All our jobs also come with a landscaping plan. It's real important to think about things like landscaping right at the start of the build. Especially if you've got a digger on site, you're moving dirt, you're building fences. You don't just want to know where you're building your house, you want to know where you're putting all your outdoor living. So once the digger built up the site, we can crack on with the slab. We're putting down a rib rough foundation. We've got boxing going up, pods going down, and then we pour concrete. This is a huge milestone, and I always say to our team, now the job is set in stone. You want all of your outside concrete to be 150 mils below the finished floor, except for where the car goes into the garage, you are allowed to follow this detail to minimize that gap. Can you imagine driving over 150 mil lip of concrete? Basically, we're allowed to drop the rebate 20 mils, then we're allowed to have a 30 mil lip, and we've got to make sure that that ramp falls away from the garage. All of these rules are in place to make sure that if there is excessive raining or flooding outside, you're minimizing the chances of it flooding inside. So any concrete needs to be a minimum 150 mils below floor level and any unpaved dirt or grass needs to be a minimum of 225 mils below floor level. On this one here we also had to do a concrete footing for a SED post and this has been designed not just to take the load going down into the ground but this footing has also been designed to resist uplift. Basically it's a little anchor that sits there and holds the entranceway roof in place so that if there's a strong wind, that entranceway roof doesn't get peeled away. The house is starting to take shape. And if you want to see more of our houses taking shape like this, go ahead and click subscribe. Now let's take a look at the floor plan. This floor plan makes the most of the long skinny section. You've got the garage at the front and you walk past that to get into an entranceway. Coming directly off the entranceway is a north facing kitchen dining living room capturing that midday sun and the evening sun shining into that living room there. Got a master bedroom with ensuite walk-in wardrobe at the end and right beside it is a small office or what could be used as a nursery room. Then we have two larger sized bedrooms both adjacent to the main bathroom. We have sliders off the living and the master onto the patio area and the laundry is tucked in the corner of the garage here. Really nice design, really maximizing the floor plan to get three and a half bedrooms in there. So frames come to site, wherever timber touches concrete, we need to put down DPC or damp proof course. We put a layer of polythene under the concrete and that stops any moisture going from the dirt to the concrete. But concrete is a very porous thing that absorbs moisture in the air, moisture in the earth surrounding it, and then it'll transfer it to the timber frames. And then what they found is that the timber frames used to rot out from the bottom wherever they were touching the concrete. So we put a layer of DPC or damp proof course between the concrete and the frames. We can then go and stand the frames and we shoot them down to the slab. Then we brace them with these temporary braces 
So once frames are up, roof trusses are on, we now need to put scaffold up. We put this around the perimeter of the building and it has what's called edge protection. This means that we can crack on with the roof without falling off and hurting ourselves. Here in New Zealand, we also use safety nets on all our builds. This means if you slip through a gap on the roof while you're doing the framing, you don't go splat on the concrete. So then we crack on with fascia, spouting and roofing iron. So it's 158 square meter floor plan, but it's 188 square meters of roof. And now that's for two reasons. You can see around the perimeter of the building here where the roof extends beyond the floor line. That's called an overhang or a suffit. You can see here the fall on the roof. It's all 25 degrees. These internal gaps here are called valleys and these external lines here are called ridges. You can also see on this plan here, we have to install roof bracing that keeps everything nice and rigid and straight. Here was where we put the post footing to hold the veranda, and in here we had to put two veranda beams to hold up this section of the roof, and they will catch trusses that span over that distance. One of the other things with a roof plan is that each downpipe is only allowed to capture a certain amount of rain and we're even marking where in the roof the spouting starts to fall towards each downpipe. Once the roof is on, we put building paper on the walls, we put our cavity battens up, and then we put our windows in. On this one here, we use James Hardy linear weatherboard, and we also used a Hard as Rocks schist veneer on the front corners to make it pop. For the hardest rocks, we put a 9mm fibre cement sheet over our cavity battens. We then screw a bunch of brick tag ties to that and the hardest rocks product gets individually placed stone by stone on that sheet. We also then painted the weatherboards a two-tone colour here to give the outside a little bit of variety. Now that we've finished outside, we can crack on with things inside. That includes pre-wire and pre-plumb. Our Sparky and our plumber will walk around with our clients, make sure that they're happy with where all their fixtures and fittings are going. Do they want to put anything extra in the walls while it's open? We can put insulation in the walls. We don't actually have to insulate the garages and this is often a choice for our clients. So we actually only need to insulate the building envelope, excluding the garage. That's because you don't live in your garage. We offer as our upgrade to all our clients, but again, it comes down to how you're gonna use the house and where you're spending your money. Our clients here opted to upgrade things like a central heating system instead of insulating the garage. And then we get what's called a pre-line inspection. And once we've passed that, we can put jib up. So jib's gone up on the walls and now we can get what's called a post line inspection. Post line inspection is making sure that we screwed off all the jib properly. Here in New Zealand we use jib as a bracing element and so we need to make sure that's been done correctly and before that gets plastered and you can't see that. Here is an example of a bracing plan for this house. A typical jib brace would be a GS1 or we also have BL1s. So everywhere there's one of these lines, that's an internal bracing element. GS1 is the simplest brace and is basically just jib screwed off with extra screws. A BL1 also incorporates a special bracket in the framing that ties everything together. We just follow the rules and people way smarter than us have worked out that apparently this is the best way to brace a house. Plaster comes in, we install all the internal doors, we do skirts and arcs, and now we can crack on with paint. This is where the house really starts to feel like a home. We put the kitchen cabinets in, the stone bench gets measured, we will put down the hard flooring and the soft flooring. Ideally we've been working outside, we've poured a concrete driveway, we've put the patio down, we've started the landscaping, and now we apply for what's called a final inspection and a code of compliance certificate. This one here, like all our other builds, passed with flying colors, and we were then able to hand it over to our happy owners who have been living in it for over a year now. Let's take a look at the finished home.